the Fullerton Public Library for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, with, as mentioned, is a pretty timely subject. Um, tonight's discussion, or my talk, is a mix of material from my own research on 19th century California. Uh, it also includes an example from our rich uh, material housed at the Center for Oral and Public History, and it also includes some personal family history um, that I figured I'd share tonight. So with that, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Margie Brown Coronel. I'm Assistant Professor of History at, in the Department of History at Cal State Fullerton. I received my PhD from UC Irvine, and I received my BA from UC Berkeley. I was raised in the city of Los Angeles in a neighborhood nestled between downtown LA and Hollywood. It's called Silver Lake, Echo Park region is where I grew up. So like many of you, my passion for history started at home with my parents. My father, Jerry Brown, he's sixth generation Irish American from Brooklyn, who always knew how to tell a good story, and my mother's courageous journey from Mexico were critical ingredients to me becoming a history. In fact, I'd like to dedicate this talk to them, and I'm thrilled to have my mom, my mother, join us this evening as her story is integrated into this talk. So family and individual stories. While the border can launch a thousand discussions and be the topic of varied presentations soaked with examples of histories of politicized debate and policy analysis, a litany of statistics such as 300 million crossings a day, 90 million cars, $650 million in trade across the border. All these things could take up a talk uh, about the border. But I thought we'd explore the ever-shifting meaning and function of the border. And I thought I'd take this opportunity to offer a more intimate look at how the border figured in the lives of everyday people at different historical moments. After all, there is one thing I've learned is that people love personal stories, stories of individuals, of families, and that ultimately is what connects us as human beings. And for me, that is the study of history. So tonight, I'm going to share with you three different experiences to open up a discussion of how the border function in people's lives. These, marks, these experiences are marked by three dates, and here I'm gonna give a nod to my advisor, Vicky Ruiz, who wrote an article, gosh, probably about 13 years ago, called um, Nuestra America. It looks at three key dates of how Latino history is integrated into U.S. history, 1848, 1898, 1948. So I'm picking three dates as well, following her fine example. Mine are a little more random, we may think, but they tell the story of these families. So before we get to the dates, I'd like to explore how we understand the border. And so I'd like to invite you to join me to think about borders, border crossers, and borderlands. And how this might be, thinking of these three, these different concepts may give us a new understanding of the past. So I'd like to ask you, what comes to mind when you think of borders? And we'll make this an interactive moment. What comes to mind when you think of borders? I'll say. Sure, yeah. Right now, it's all the border wall. Is a wall, right, right. That's, a that's right now what comes to my, to my mind is the, 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 the why the wall, what is already there, and right. just Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, something that divides and separates. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But it's okay. also a space to interact. Right, exactly. It's a, it's a meeting place, too, right? A, pl a place where nation states, communities, lands, people all come up to one another, right? Any other? All right, well, indeed, borders are often associated as clear markings that have distinguished the na nation states. 
right? Those are the kind of geopolitical borders that um, are in our common understanding and even popular understandings. And the study of borderlands emerged from a various different um, directions in response to this understanding of more division and separation. For example, scholars um, felt that by focusing on national borders led to histories that were focused on the nation state, uh, resulting in the exclusion of people and experiences not formally recognized by the nation state, or who didn't see themselves as part of the nation state. Another impetus for borderlands emerged from the interest and need to understand con uh, communities continuously excluded by the nation state. So let's define borderlands. And I'll share a little bit about how this has informed my own research and kind of gives us a way to think about the examples I'm gonna share with you today. So the study of the borderlands is de defined by, quote, transnational interactions, the emergence of communities and societies shaped by these interactions, sometimes called border societies, and cross-boundary and cross-cultural links. Much of what has been mentioned today, a place of meeting, a place of convergence, a place of exchange. What I like to think about a borderlands is a place of movement, right, and unexpected results. So as a young scholar seeking to understand the experiences and choices made by Spanish, Mexican, Californians, which is a group that I study, I found the borderlands and the study of the borderlands as the definition I offered, rich with possibilities to capture the complexity and texture of people who found the border shifting beneath their feet. Borderlands also offered the possibility to nuance the experience of border crossers, people who moved across borders at different moments. So what results when we look at borderlands and border crossers? In my opinion, we gain a rich dynamic view of concepts like the border, and its complicated past. The border and its history is no longer relegated to a story that goes from a random location somewhere in the middle, right, which was it once was before 1840, uh, to a line in the desert of, of the Southwest, to a guard post, to a triple fence, and to possibly a wall. But rather, borderlands gives us the chance to think of the border and its meaning as a concept as an instrument and as an experience. So as we move forward to these snapshots into the past, I'd like us to keep in mind a few questions. Where is the border at work in this scenario, meaning the border of separation and division? Right? Where does it surface in unexpected places? Meaning it's not very always a physical border. Right? Sometimes it's a border put in practice, into practice. Who are the border crossers? Right? And how are new borderlands created in these dynamics? So these are the questions that guide my discussion this evening. So let's venture, let's, let's take a step into the past of our example. So I'd first like to take you to 1861 and to the life of Josefa, Josefa del Valle. Josefa del Valle was born in 1861 and she was a descendant of a Spanish Mexican family who had settled in California in the 1780s. Some of the earliest pobladores that ventured from northern Mexico, or what is now northern Mexico, before it was probably central Mexico, ventured up with an expedition and settled in the Pueblo de Los Angeles in 1783. This is a picture of the Valles. Uh, oops. Up in the top, I'm sorry if you can't see it very clearly. Um, the Del Valle home was located on the Plaza of Los Angeles, which is this picture right here. This is what the Plaza looked like in the late 19th century. And for Spanish-Mexican families who dated their settlement in California during the Spanish colonial era, they all resided in the Plaza. That's where the hub was. It was a social, political, and cultural center of life in, in Southern California. Families like those of Bernardo Yorba, who owned Rancho de Santa Ana, which is the land that we are now on, the, the zone, he had a home in the Plaza of Los Angeles. So the Lavalle home was located in Los Angeles, but they also owned a rancho, 
And that rancho was called Rancho Camulos, and it was part of a larger rancho. And this is what the land grant looked like that they were issued from Mexico in the 1830s. So you can see it doesn't look like a standard kind of map of American land holdings. It's kind of, it's marked by rivers and stones and forests and small rolling hills and creeks. Their land was located in what is now Heritage Valley, which is located between Los Angeles and Ventura. Has anybody been up to Magic Mountain? Yeah? Okay, so the five freeways. So there's Highway 126. It cuts across. If you want to avoid Highway 101, you go across Highway 126. I have a map here that's not very visible here. But you can see in Rancho Camulos here, here's Santa Barbara, Ventura, Oxnard and um, Los Angeles. So they were right on the way from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara. The point of this is that the Dalayas didn't live at Rancho Camulos. They lived at the plaza. But in 1861, a few months after Josefa's birth, the family decides to move permanently to Rancho Camulos. Why? Well, we can go back a little bit in time to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is established in 1848, it brought the end to the U.S.-Mexican War, and it established particular rights for the people who were living in California under Mexican uh, sta uh, nationhood, right? So when the U.S. takes over this, what is now the Southwest, they guarantee two rights, well, two main, and they guarantee a lot of things, but the two things that are most important for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 is one, it guarantees citizenship, people in California, Spanish Mexican people. And it also recognizes their land rights, so their land holdings. So in theory, ideally, under the treaty, the Del Valle's land of Rancho Camulos should have been safe, but it wasn't. It was constantly under threat of settlers, of squatters, of people contesting their land title. At the same time that there are threats being posed on their rancho, which was remote, the Los Angeles Plaza is shifting. It's increasingly moving from a Mexican pueblo to an American city. And what that means is the arrival of American immigrants, white American immigrants, uh, changing laws, changing practices. The social and political stability of Spanish Mexican families begins to waver, begins to weaken. So these two forces of uh, losing ground in the plaza and constant threats to the rancho, the family makes a difficult choice to move permanently. Now they had never lived on the rancho. They have never worked in agriculture. This was not their life. So they make these big decisions, extreme decisions, to change their course. And this is the world that Josefa del Valle was born into and that she's raised into. And if we go back to my questions uh, that I posed earlier, where is the border in this moment? Right? The border was established in the, uh, in the southwest at a clear point, but we see it operating in the plaza, where people are being separated from a life, from a practices that they had traditionally held on to for generations. We see it at work in the rancho in land in California, where people's holdings are under threat given this new sovereignty. But we do see borderlands created, right? New dynamics. So life on the rancho for somebody like Josefa del Valle was a moment of innovation, was a moment of change. The family transitions the rancho from cattle, which was a dwindling industry in California, to a dynamic agricultural enterprise. And you can see up here uh, in this picture, it's a family picture of all the different people who worked at Rancho Camulos, of the people who would visit Rancho Camulos, because it then became the social and cultural hub of the family. So they shifted their world to the rancho, from the plaza to the rancho. But what 1861 and the life of Josefa del Valle that she can the world that she lives in tells us a um, story of other developments where we can explore borders, border crossers, and borderlands. 
Now that the Valle is in their efforts to revamp the rancho as an agricultural enterprise, uh, it shows the dynamic growth of Southern California during this time period in the late 19th century, right? Uh, we have the arrival of railroads, of mining in different parts of the state, of ranching, ranching in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas, other parts of the Southwest are developed, and agriculture, right, and citrus. In fact, the Valle family is the first family to grow citrus in Ventura, and they then send, send that to different parts of Orange County. But what we see here is a different type of border crossings, right? One, the border has crossed, it has moved with the U.S.-Mexican War. And who are our border crossers at this time? It's U.S. industry. So not only is U.S. industry seeing a promise and the profit, profitability of the natural resources in the Southwest, right? In the desert mining, in the vast plains of Texas for ranching, in California's continuous sunshine to allow for agricultural production, they move west and they also move south. So really the first border crossers in the late 19th century is U.S. industry. In fact, they move, U.S. industry moves down all the way into Central America during this time period. And by 1924, U.S industrial investment or uh, capital investment in, uh, is half of all U.S. foreign investment is in, is in Latin America. Right? Uh, by 1910, U.S. companies own all of the control of Mexican oil. Um, they own a majority of land holdings. They're in control of a majority of land holdings. 80% of the agricultural is under U.S. Uh, control, U.S. corporate control in places like Mexico, Nicaragua, Honduras, Puerto Rico. Uh, so our first set of border crossers is U.S. industry. And this is a kind of world of the borderlands, right? There's not just a movement north, there's movement south during this time period. And I feel that the Laya family, the snapshot of 1861 where these changes are really in full flux, tell us the story through their personal choices as a family. Which brings us to our next date. Now this is kind of a leap, <laughs> 1938, where I take you to the Castaneda family. Now this top picture, you see a picture of Emilia Castaneda. And her oral history is housed, and it was one of the earliest um, oral histories collected at the Center for Oral and Public History. And it's part of a rich collection of stories recorded of people who were unconstitutionally deported to Mexico in the 1930s. But what her story tells us is that the movement across the border was dynamic. Right? And it gives us a snapshot into the 20th century, early 20th century, migration patterns, and what results out of these patterns. So in the early 20th century, we see two forces at play that give rise to a legacy of restrictions. First, you have an increasing demand for labor. I just mentioned how U.S. industry sweeps into the Southwest to take advantage of the agricultural profits that are available in growing citrus and growing different types of crops, of mining, of industry. And so this has, this called for a great demand for labor. And the one place where these laborers were found was in, was in Mexico. People who were facing dire living conditions, extreme poverty, mostly because of US corporate control of land resources and labor, uh, it was very difficult to make a living and survive. So people ventured north to take advantage of these opportunities. In the top corner here, we have a picture of Japanese and Mexican laborers working in beet industries. And the, beet in the sugar beet industry was just one example of the type of crops that required um, cheap labor. Right? Citrus was another, oranges, lemons, 
um, all across the Central Valley uh, here in Orange County. The innovation in technology for irrigation made growing crops that much faster, so the demand for laborers to keep up with the growth was in need. But the arrival of immigrants in the early 20th century, and not just Mexican immigrants, but immigrants from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, from Asia, launched efforts and fears to keep America um, as purely white as possible. And with that, we had a series of immigration restrictions. And so we see the borders emerging as dividing very clearly in this time period. So in 1924, there was an immigration act that was passed that set quotas, restricting immigration from different parts of Europe and, and absolutely um, excluding people from Asia. If we move, go back a little earlier to 1917, there was a literacy act, immigration act that was passed that tested people's literacy uh, and contingent upon that was whether or not they could gain entry. And I remember as an undergraduate, I did research on this pro project, on this topic, and I found scores of telegrams from California growers to their congressmen asking to exclude Mexican laborers from that law. Uh, because they knew it would, they would take a, a big hit on the arrival, on their um, access to, to laborers. But the 1924 Act is critical because it basically cuts off immigration and it really rises the, the nation's borders to exclude people. At the same time, and to ensure the enforcement of this law, in 1924 you have the rise of the Border Patrol. So how does this affect Emilia Castaneda? Well, by 1930, when the depression is fully hit, has hit people, uh, she found herself as an American citizen packing her bags and getting ready to relocate back to Mexico. Now this was part of a repatriation, it was called repatriation effort, but basically it was a deportation project. And this one came out of fears of the depression, that Mexican laborers were taking jobs that should be for Americans. It also, and the way this was regulated or carried out was that social workers, social agencies, um, public health agencies were sent into communities and workplaces to find those who, who were not properly documented. It also targeted anybody who was taking any sort of public assistance. And in, in, in Emilia's case, both her parents had fled the Mexican Revolution in the early 20th century. They had uh, settled with stable jobs. Her mother was a domestic worker. Her father was a mason worker. And they purchased their home in Boyle Heights, which is located right there on Folsom Street. And they were living a pretty sound life until her father was fired and her mother contracted tuberculosis and she had to go to the local, local public infirmary to get treatment. And because she took that form of public assistance, they were targeted for deportation. And in the bottom corner is a picture of the thousands, estimates are in the millions of number of Mexicans, including Mexicans, um, uh, people, citizens of Mexican descent who were sent back to Mexico. And there is a media. So she arrives in Mexico, not flu very fluent in Spanish, never having been to Mexico, without her mother, because her mother passes, and her father <coughs> moving from town to town to find jobs. So again, where is the border in this situation? Where does it emerge? It emerges in the fields, in the barrios, in places like Wahabra, where people were found, targeted, and told to, be go, to go back to Mexico. And where are the borderlands? Well, Emilia takes her story to Mexico. She informs family of her experience as a U.S. citizen. She continues to see her sights on returning to the United States. But you can't help but think that an experience like that informs Mexico, right? And so we have borderlands emerge in two places, where we have this return migration, whether it be forced or by choice, changes the dynamic. Um, Emilia returns to the United States in 1944 after securing 
all kinds of different documentation to prove her citizenship status. And I really love this picture of her because Amelia has taken this story on the road. She has uh, launched a campaign, uh, she launched a campaign that was quite successful in changing the California state standards in primary education to include the story of unconstitutional deportation. And there she is speaking at an event where the state issued an apology to the thousands of people who were forced back to Mexico. So we see the borders at play here. We see borderlands. We see border crossers going back and coming. And this is the movement that I find that is so exciting and tells us that the border has had continuously different, differing meaning across time. It changes. It changes locations. It moves um, in unexpected ways. The last date I want to share with you is 1967. Now, you might not be able to see this, but this is a story of Margarita Brown, my mom. <laughs> and 1967 is a special date. First, I have to owe it for my mom coming to the United States. Um, a bold move. She came alone, not having any family here in Los Angeles, and was seeking a way to help her family and new opportunities. In the top right hand corner is the certificate she gained after completing her course in English to prepare herself to become a secretary here in the United States in Los Angeles. And so when we think of the year of 1967 when my mom arrived in the United States, how is that year special? Well, before we can think of that year special. I think it's special because it greatly has an impact on my own life. But it tells us of a new era of borderlands, right? Because my mother's story and my mother's arrival here in the United States would not have been made possible without the 1965 Immigration Act, which was a great change in the immigration policy and the way borders functioned in people's lives. So in, 18, in 1965, the Hart Seller Act was passed, and it was an immigration act that ended the quota system that was established in 1924. Right? So now, after 1965, people were able to not freely, but openly come to the United States. People like my mom. Prior to this point, the only people who were really allowed entry were people under contract labor systems, like the Bracero program. Right, which was exclusive to men who were going to labor in agricultural production. This, that program was established in the 1940s to meet a labor shortage as a result of World War II. But the 1965 Immigration Act changed immigration to the United States. And we can say it altered the social and cultural landscape of places like Southern California. And what results is what we all enjoy and benefit today. At the same time in the 1965, or concurrently, is you have social, political upheaval in places in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and Middle East, which is propelling people to seek out safety, survival, and new opportunities. And my mother's story is embedded in this change. Right? And so what results from this. We have LA neighborhoods. Now I grew up in a neighborhood, like I mentioned earlier, uh, between Hollywood and downtown LA. And I can share with you that I learned to say hello in three different languages, Spanish, Tagalog, and Armenian. <laughs> I learned how to say curse words in all three languages too. <laughs> I learned how to communicate in Spanish with those from El Salvador and Guatemala uh, who all share a different style of Spanish. And I think it's the borderlands that I grew up in that resulted from the 1965 Immigration Act and the shifting and ever-changing communities that surround us. And so who are the border crossers? Where is the border? 
What are the borderlands? I think that we would not be able to enjoy our um, neighborhoods and our neighbors without this Immigration Act, because we wouldn't have the rich diversity that we have in places like Garden Grove and Santana in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. So to conclude my presentation and give us a chance to uh, talk a little bit and exchange some thoughts about the borderlands and borders, um, I'd like to close with the theorist, poet, and scholar Gloria Ansaldúa, who says in her text, The Borderlands, La Frontera, those who make borders shouldn't be surprised by border crossers. I hope these three vignettes offer us a way to rethink this concept called the border, to consider where is it at work? Is a border a dividing line at schools, in neighborhoods, and in communities? What borderlands are emerging in the US or in places like Guadalajara, where there are emerging communities of people who are returning home, trying to figure out a new landscape after being deported? Or is the borderlands in the violence-ridden communities of El Salvador, where hope of survival is kept alive by the reminder of family and friends who have made it in El Norte? Or perhaps down the street where we enjoy our favorite pupusas and tortas? Certainly in the communities that have grown since 1965 and sustained this very state we call home. So as we approach tense times, I hope that we, when we think of the border, we think of a long legacy of human choices made. And perhaps we are all, in some form, border crossers. Thank you. So I'm happy to take, I told Kent, I'm not a bit, I don't go on and on and on and on. So I hope that there are some questions or comments from the audience, um, discussion we could have about borders, borderlands, and border crossings. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, I mean, 1917, also, but what were the effects of uh, the Mexican Revolution and World War I, which kind of coincided? And yes, exactly, yeah. Well, the Mexican Revolution is, um, is really, turning the country upside down. And people are uh, fleeing their towns and villages, they're fleeing violence, they're feeling, fleeing starvation, and they are um, in masses going to the northern border. First, there's already this practice of moving to the border for the industry, right, because you have you know, mining and agriculture, so there's this practice of moving to the border. And the Mexican Revolution just sends people that that's the way to safety. And there are refugee camps that are set up in places like Nogales, Arizona, and Las Cruces, New Mexico, all across the U.S.-Mexico border to receive these refugees. Um, and it's kind of controlled by the U.S. military um, people from World War I, right? Like this kind of now new U.S. Army that is um, full-fledged uh, is part of this kind of uh, servicing the refugees. So. To answer your question, the Mexican Revolution, first it forces these people northward, right? Um, and precisely uh, in meeting the needs of growers, right, for laborers. So it's kind of the convergence of two forces. And so in the, that 1917 act is um, debated in Congress, they do. They exempt Mexican workers uh, and immigrants from that. There are also tons of immigration acts that seek to monitor and control who can and who cannot enter the United States. For instance, there's the um, establishment of the Board of Special Inquiry in the 19-teens, and it's right around this Literacy Act. And so it kind of shows us how immigration policy and border crossing is a very gendered experience. So while Mexican men, who are seen as laborers, and can fend for themselves in the United States. Mexican women are um, forced to go through a board of special inquiry if they're attempting to immigrate without a man, so without a husband or without a father. 
So if they come alone or they come with their children or they come as sisters, um, sorry, like these women here, am I going the wrong way? We'll get there. Um, maybe I'll just Who's jump to the it. Introduction? There we go, like these women. Uh, they would go through a s different processing and inquiry. They would be asked, who are you going to go live with in the United States? How are you going to earn, how are you going to not become a questionable woman if, since you're coming alone? Because it, there wasn't an understanding that women could work and sustain themselves, right? So single women would uh, be sent through a special inquiry. So the policies target different types of people, but what they all tell us is that the border functioned, it kind of opened and closed depending on US needs for labor, right? And it also opened and closed depending on US fears, fearful ideology of those who would you know, pose a threat or charge to society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my father, who was born in Mexico in 1933, talks a lot about his grandfather and his uncles. At one time, they'd just go to a box or something, put a vessel in, and they'd receive, and, and then they could cross into the yeah. United States, and they'd work, and they'd, it was kind of like a free flow situation. Absolutely. Have you heard of that? Like, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Um, in fact, you know, I had started my talk that way, right? Like, let's look at a history of the kind of how people could move. And I mean, I think this picture, which was, you know, on the flyer too, this is the border. <laughs> I mean, when we, this is uh, Nogales, Arizona, one side is Arizona, one side is Mexico, and those booths are, for, you know, just where people would pass through. Um, and yes, indeed, people would move back and forth. And that's, again, kind of why Borderlands was, is, is such kind of an interesting way to understand this, because people could move back and forth. And that's one of the reasons why Mexican Im Im immigrants are not considered in that quota, is because they could go home. Whereas an Italian, or a Russian Jew, or Japanese, or Chinese person, you know, it's a little harder for them to get home, right? Uh, they have to cross the sea, but Mexican laborers, they go home, they move it back, and so they're not seen as a temporary people, right? And so early Mexican immigration to the United States is, is fluid, it's revolving. People go home and they come back, and they go home and they come back, in fact, Historians and scholars have argued that the rise of undocumented immigration is not so much this new change in how people come, but it's a reflection of policy. Because when that booth turns into a wire, and then a triple fence, and then you know these big gates, people can't go and come back, and yeah. so they stay. Um, because things get complicated. People make choices. They have children. They meet partners. They find work. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, it seemed like in my family, it was a very much like, you come over here, you work a little mm -hmm. bit, your wife and kids stay home. Right. And it was just like mm -hmm. free flow. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until later on, in like, my, in my mm -hmm. newer generation, it's like, they bring their, they have to bring their wives mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it was just too hard going back right, and forth. Right, right. Ana Rosa, she's a, um, and I want to, if you're interested, I have the sources for, you know, where I brought the examples of my talk, but just to share about the rich history that is uh, being, um, that is emerging about all these different dynamics. Ana Rosa, she's a professor at UC Irvine, and she studies the, the Bracero program, and her um, book, Abrazando el Espíritu, starts in Mexico, right, of braceros who leave their town to come work in the United States. And then she looks at the correspondence um, and the women leaving going to find their men folk, right? Uh, Miroslava Chavez Garcia also looks at the correspondence across these kind of transnational dynamics uh, when it's increasingly harder for people to go home. How does courtship unfold? How do people reunite? Um, what are the difficult choices they have to make? 
but yeah, indeed. Uh, and a lot of people remember that, remember just going back and forth. Yeah. Uh, yes, and then Barbara will take You talked about the American companies or whatever going down into Mexico, Central America, and what have you, and either controlling the agriculture or what have you. Right. What is the status of that now? Oh. Um, so I, um, when I wrote out my talk, I had all kinds of more dates, and I'm thinking I probably could have gotten, you know, 1994 with NAFTA, right, uh, the free trade agreement, which, you know, part of the story is not only how the border is a, um, a divider, but it's also a magnet, right, like, so it attracts people. So with NAFTA in the 1990s, U.S. industry goes to south of the border even with even more force and vigor. Uh, and they set up what were called the maquiladoras, right, which were the factories. Um, and they still exist in Mexico and in the in, even into the interior of Mexico. Um, so the status of that, I would say, it's still robust. It's still pretty dynamic. Um, I think you pick up any kind of clothing garment and it's produced abroad. Um, and it's U.S. industries uh, kind of and relentless, it's and well. it's multinational. There's also Japanese, right? Exactly. Chinese ja industries. Yeah, right. In Aguascalientes, there's a Honda factory and a Nissan factory, and it, they're transnational corporations. Um, but yeah, you have um, electronic products. Uh, piecemeal products that are produced in Mexico and in Central America and even in places like the Caribbean and Southeast Asia of U.S. industry seeking for the, the cheapest mode of production, right? The, the lowest price they can get for the production. Of so the are they in control of like the land for the agriculture? Oh, uh, you mean right now? Oh, so... So yeah. right now, um, in, in Mexico, what resulted from their revolution was a um, land rights. So what the, the, the Mexican revolution is a fight over land. And it's precisely in response to the um, US and foreign interest in Mexico. And so you know the people launch a revolution, and there's land redistributed to the people of Mexico. And they basically expel foreign interests. And uh, so the oil industry is uh, repatriated and nationalized uh, and is still under control of the Mexican state. So the Mexican state controls that. Um, I would say landowner and agriculture, it's a mix of corporate, uh, of individual farmers, but the foreign interest is more um, an agreement that was made between the two nations, um, something like NAFTA. So while national there's national ownership of land, they lease out the land, or they contract with U.S. industries uh, and corporations to be able to operate in those countries. I can't say for other places in the world, I wouldn't, I wouldn't right. know, but well, I'm sure there's... Like, for instance, they could make a living here because they wanted to come here right. because of that situation. Right. So I was wondering what it right. is like now in comparison. So if we think about 1967, and the Immigration Act of 1965, and what's happening in these countries is um, big social upheaval because of this history of U.S. and foreign interests, both politically and economically, in these countries. And you have these nations responding uh, to regain, you know, sovereignty or control, political control, um, because when you kind of control the money, you control. Politics, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you have U.S. interests kind of backing different political movements that that benefit them. And what those struggles result in is in a devaluation of their currency. So, like in Mexico, right after NAFTA is passed, there is a devaluation of the peso almost immediately, right? And U.S. goods can now flood Mexican markets, right? So where everything was made in Mexico before, now you have products from all over a part of this free trade, and it spikes the price of things when people's salaries are not increasing. So the way, the, the means to live is, is hardship, and you have more people in the 80s and 90s coming to the United States.
the work radius. To work. Work radius situation. It's not that. Pretty much. That's kind of like why I say let's think yeah. of who are our border crossers because right. it takes kind of the presence of the U.S. and these countries really early on into the late 19th centuries. In my classes, um, my students get a real kick out of it. We, um, we look at this kind of training video that is sent to corporate men and women of life in Guatemala, right? Because the banana and the fruit industry are big in Central America. And there were promotional and kind of training videos of what life is like in Guatemala and um, who are Puerto Ricans, right? Like for companies going into Puerto Rico and, you know, how to tell uh, different ethnic backgrounds and what they eat and how the city is laid out and it's all to inform company people of the life they might expect or the people they might encounter when they set up shop in, in places like Central America. It's really interesting. My students are like, I never knew that U.S. was so present. And yeah, it's huge, yeah. Very great question. Barbara, you had oh, your hand up. I, I just noticed that you had used Oscar um, uh, Martinez's yes, yeah. Border People. Yes. And I love his, um, it's four different groups of people and how they reacted to the border. Mm -hmm. And there were people who were nationalists on both sides of the border right. who wouldn't cross it. Right. And then moving down a, you know, towards each other where there's people who live on both sides of the border. They have homes on both sides of the border. They work on one side, go to school on another. It's true. And and so along the the border itself, there are there's a whole society that exists that mm -hmm. some people who live on the border wouldn't be aware of because right. they don't right. interact. Right. Right. And that was brought home to me when a group of us I won't say how many years ago because I don't date that. My hair is great. So. Uh, <laughs> We were down in Tijuana interviewing people mm -hmm. uh, in neighborhoods to find out things about their housing and stuff. Right. And we walked up to this one house, and here's this guy from one of our classes, you know, washing his car. He said, oh, what you guys up to? So he got interviewed. And <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, to, even today there are for people who cross oh, yeah. the U.S.-Mexican border, as, as challenging as it may be. But you know, if we think about, um, I was just at a conference, um, and one of my colleagues, she's she studies the um, Arizona border, and there's a family who, you know, they had their business on one side of the border, on the U.S. side, and then their home on the Mexican side, and it and that was purely a result of where they just drew the line, and there's this constant movement back and forth, back and forth um, across across the border. And, and it's true, it kind of when the parents, everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. See what you learned from that, yeah. you know, family history. I have the green car. Yeah. yeah. So, no, even if you were documented, you were authorized to, to be here. You're you had required to do that. Huh. I don't know. I'll ask. I'll ask. Um, I'm, you know, I, <laughs> um, in my training, of course, I learned, especially in Borderlands, you know, but my, my research is in 19th century and early right. 20th century California history. Um, but I will, I'll find out because it is interesting. I mean, so much changes. I mean, just in my own lifetime, to hear it go from INS, right, to yeah. ICE, to, right, like all this, these name changes. Um, yeah. And then the practices and policies and forms that change, um, it's kind of uh, interesting to see these shifts and where they come out of, right, who, who they're where their efforts go. Yeah, right. Remember, I used to go to the Mexican consulate yeah, and remember that. see Maria Eugenia. Mm -hmm. yeah. She I was the uh, top official. <laughs> so she gave me my, my OK. Yeah. yeah. No, I remember going to downtown. And that's where, you know, kind of have these interests. You know, we would go to the federal building and stand in line no, and I get the permission and, <laughs> and the Mexican <laughs> consulate. So um, yeah, I mean, these things play out in everyday lives. And personal ways and intimate ways. And I think sometimes when we hear about borders and, you know, especially with the, you know, tension and the highly politicized, we, we lose sight of the humanity um, and the human experiences that inform these choices. Yeah, everything comes to mind.
<laughs> I know my mom on the drive up, she was ta telling me all these different stories, and she's like, it's gone by really fast. <laughs> and I think it was in, well, just 2017, 2000, from 1967, she completed a big anniversary here in the yeah. United States. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are there still areas like uh, rather porous, kind of like the middle of nowhere, deserts mm -hmm. areas where uh, I remember reading in a newspaper uh, about um, some. I think when Trump had put the military yeah. personnel out there, and they and they were in uh, in an area where nobody was neither uh, the United States. The U.S. soldiers or the Mexican uh, federales, or, or they're both there, and they went and talked to each other and figuring out who was on what, who was where, oh, you know, where exactly yeah. was the border. Right. I mean, because right. neither one of them, you know, nobody knew where they were. It was the middle of nowhere, right, right. and nobody knew which side of nowhere. Yeah. No, it's so true, and I mean. Um, it's, it's, if you've seen aerials of that desert, right, there is a film, um, it's a documentary film called Dying to Live, and it's, um, produced and made by a nonprofit organization, kind of like a, a Catholic migrant resource, um, organization, but the film starts with an aerial of the desert, right, of the... Arizona desert, and it, and it is just vast. I mean, to think of how you follow a geopolitical line across that space, and then you think of people trying to traverse that landscape. I mean, one has to be pushed to very extreme to make that decision to cross that desert. And yeah, I mean, it's true, and, and not just thinking about the Mexican federales and then the uh, border Patrol agents that have to kind of figure out what their domain is and what their, um, what is it called, their, their, their area to patrol is, but you think about the environment, right? And in, in 1924, when the Border Patrol was established, the biggest challenge they had was contending with the Apache Nation. Because the Apache Nation, and this is something that doesn't make uh, it's way into my talk, but if we think about like the legacy of borders and the human experience, uh, the Apache had the historic domain over the Southwest in majority of the region of the border, of where the border emerges. And so how do you explain to a sovereign nation, the Apache, that there is this new border, right? Because they were moving and they were controlling it too, right? Um, in their, in all kinds of ways, right? And it's one of the reasons why nobody's there, because <laughs> the Apache were a force to contend with. Um, and so, yeah, that they, they faced those, those same issues in, 19, in the 1920s. Well, I think, thank you so much. Thank you. For